All right, I think we're good. So hello everyone and welcome. Uh, my name is Michelle Schenke. I am with the Office of Global Affairs. And um, I'd like to thank you all for attending our panel discussion today on approaches to global and environmental issues. Um, happy International Education Week to everyone. Um, just to give you all an update, International Education Week is a joint initiative of the US Department of State and the Department of Education. And this is a global event that's observed by um, institutions of higher education around the world. And the purpose of this is to really celebrate international education and exchange and also promote international understanding. So um, with this in mind, I'm very excited that this year we are partnering with the Institute for Globalization Studies at Stony Brook. And um, we're excited to hear from our impressive interdisciplinary panel um, of Stony Brook faculty on global and environmental issues. Um, and now I'm going to introduce Professor Sophie Raynard Leroy, who will lead our discussion and introduce all of our panelists to you. Um, Professor Raynard Leroy is the director of the Institute for Globalization Studies, and she is also an associate professor in the Department of Cultural Studies and Comparative Literature where she teaches on a variety of topics, ranging from business French to cinema and cultural studies. So Professor Raynard Leroy, thank you and welcome to our panelists and I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Michelle. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this uh, round table. It is an honor to be featured in this uh, global affairs webinar during International Education Week. Um, so we're very grateful to Global Affairs for in giving us the opportunity here to develop our presence further on the Stony Brook campus and, and through SUNY and, and start a collaboration with you. So I'm Sophie Reynard Leroy, and as Michel uh, mentioned, I'm the director of the, uh, of the Institute for Globalization Studies uh, in the College of Arts and Sciences here at Stony Brook. Our mission at the Institute is to promote interdisciplinary perspectives on the challenges, opportunities, and contradictions related to the processes of globalization. We're supported by a multidisciplinary advisory board. Um, and as uh, such, we, um, as an Institute, we seek to foster scholarly collaborations on the interactions between and within global to local scales, as well as the contradictions embedded in globalization. Uh, often resulting in severe economic, political, social inequalities among people marked by territorial borders. So at the ATS, we also pay attention to the effect that globalization processes have on the environment and how in turn ecological degradation is contributing to the proliferation of conflicts and the securitization of human rights. Our lecture series theme for spring 22 is precisely climate change and how it intersects with other human factors such as forced migration and social inequalities. Today's event is therefore the perfect introduction, introduction to that theme and a good preview to, um, to our lecture series. Um, and um, it is also a, a very good way of illustrating for you what the academic degree, GLI, Globalization Studies and in International Relations, that we administer through this institute is about. We offer um, indeed a Bachelor of Arts in Globalization Studies and in International Relations, a major and a minor combi that combines the humanities, the social sciences, the natural sciences, um, and the natural sciences to prepare future leaders in global policy making, international service, diplomacy, activism, etc. And today, for you, we I have gathered uh, a panel with with um, our some of our distinguished uh, GLI faculty. I'll start with Dr. Liliana Davalos, who's a professor of conservation biology at the Department of Ecology and Evolution. Um, inspired by richness of life and cultures in the tropical forest of our native South America, Davalos has pioneered new ways of understanding how species and trait biodiversity emerge and how to prevent habitat loss in biodiversity hotspots. 
Dr. Davalos is past Cavley Frontiers of Science Fellow for um, early career, a Human Frontiers of Science Program awardee, and a contributor to the science panel for the Amazon, whose report was published at COP26 okay. that we're going to talk about today also. Davalos has published more than 80 peer-reviewed papers and co-edited two books, the Origins of Cocaine on the Historical Legacy of Development Projects in the Amazon Andes, and Philostomid Bats, the first book length update to the biology of neotropical leaf nosed bats. <laughs> Our second um, uh, guest speaker uh, is Dr. Javier Uriarte, Associate Professor in the Department of Hispanic Languages and Literature. He specializes in Latin American literature and culture, specifically on territorial imagination, environmental humanities, representations of Amazonia, conceptualization of nature and labor, and infrastructure and water. He's the author of The Desert Makers, Travel, War, and the State in Latin America, published with Routledge in, uh, Routledge in 2020, and the co-editor with Felipe Martinez Pinzon of Entre el Humo y la Niebla, Guerra y Cultura en América Latina, um, I guess it's uh, Javier University of. Can you please specify uh, the? It's a publisher. Yes. It's called Ely. Okay, Ely. It's called Ely. Okay, and it's uh, the date is 2016. And Intimate Frontiers: A Literary Geography of the Amazon from Liverpool University Press, 2019. He's currently writing a book about the Amazon at the beginning of the 20th century, with a particular focus on what he calls fluvial poetics and you maybe he'll explain to us uh, what it is about and finally our third um, speaker is Dr. Peg Spitzer uh, who is a senior lecturer at the institute and um, who is faculty um, in our degree GLI she is currently in this term um, Fall 21, a Humanities Institute Fellow. She conducts research on women's empowerment in climate change adaptation in the global south, especially in Asia. She is uh, currently writing a book tentati uh, tentatively titled Mirroring Hope, which analyzes the unconventional methods women use to address climate change and participate in the political process and illustrates how our philanthropic biases, especially regarding the global South, need to be reframed to facilitate true change globally. So I'm very pleased to have the three of you uh, gathered in this very special uh, panel representing what we do at GLI, what you do in the classroom, uh, for us in, uh, for GLI, but in your respective uh, departments or in your respective endeavors, research endeavors. And so I'll start um, um, with a question uh, directed specifically to Liliana and Javier, because I want to tell our audience that I uh, selected you to co-teach a new course at GLI, we were launched uh, last year in the fall of, of uh, 2020. And the new course that you co-taught um, was, was taught in the spring of, of 21, and you are going to teach it again this upcoming spring. Um, and it's entitled Global Cultural and Environmental Issues. Um, it's a key core course in the GLI curriculum. Per description, it is meant to provide a critical understanding of how environmental problems and conflicts have roots in global social processes such as culture, community, and political and economic inequality, and how these special forces in turn bear on the ways individuals and groups understand environmental problems and politically mobilize to change them. You focus particularly on how environmental degradation at a global scale intersects with various social problems, such as uh, like violence, spreading of disease, and international migration. So please, could you p tell us um, about your dual approach to this um, uh, environmental problem and, and its intersections and how 
such, inter, such an interdisciplinary approach is a more strategic way to address the global problem of the environment? Yes, that's that's a great question, Sophie. I have to begin, I like before talking about the course, I have to begin before the course because I have to say that I signed up to take a course with Professor Uriarte. I signed up to take a course with him because I just couldn't believe that, you know, all this focus that I have thinking about the Amazon from a purely scientific perspective, that there was somebody else who was working on the Amazon from a completely different perspective. And I wanted to experience what that was about. And that was very illuminating. And I think that it was very helpful when it came time to teach the course. It's been one of my favorite course ever to teach because the level of engagement that I had with the students and just watching this other perspective. One of the key things that I've learned um, in the process of both taking Javier's class and uh, working with Javier on the course is that it's become increasingly clear to me that you know I can we can work on building up the skills. We can we can work on with the students interpreting these new things, and I and that's something that I that I aim to do in the course as part of the learning objectives. But just having the purely scientific perspective is never enough. Because these are societal challenges, societal problems, and so we require we need to understand society and culture. And without this thinking about society and culture, where it meets the environment, if all we're saying is we're losing biodiversity or climate change is changing this and that, if all we're doing is that and we're not engaging with that other aspect, then we don't get a lot of traction. And I think the students understand that as part of our course. Thank you, Liliana. Javier, what do you have to say to Liliana in, in, in response to her, her praise of her course and how, her, how your course, um, you know, uh, inspired her? So, uh, first of all, th thank you, Sophie, and thank you for the, to the Office of Global Affairs for letting us, uh, for inviting us to have this conversation and uh, tell us, uh, tell you about a little bit of what, what we do here. Uh, and well, first of all, I have to say that uh, Liliana was a, a stellar student in my uh, PhD class. <laughs> uh, and uh, no, it was, it was really, really a pleasure to, to have her. And it's, as you can imagine, it's not, I mean, professors have a lot of uh, time, a lot of things are working on, on, on millions of things at the same time. And it's, it's so, so, it's really exceptional that another colleague sits in a, you know, in a different class to a PhD class to and do all the readings, uh, which you were a lot. <laughs> and do uh, all the writings. <laughs> the writings, yes. Um, and uh, so it was, it was a great experience. And, and it was also very important for the course to have Liliana's input and Liliana's perspective, because like approaching the Amazon uh, as we were like discussing uh, literary ways of imagining space and representing the space uh, sometimes it was it was very important to have this sort of very sort of uh, explanation of elements that were there that we were not able to see right and, and Liliana's presence was very illuminating for me and my students in that class and uh, uh, after that we decided to teach this class together which you can imagine uh, I had never thought uh, I caught out a class before so it was not uh, my first experience was the most challenging one, I think, because it's like, it's, it's really, uh, it, it, it takes something very special and very exceptional for someone, for a scientist to share with a humanist, uh, you know, this, this kind of spaces and be able to, you know, understand each other, collaborate, uh, um, realize about different folk uh, interests and uh, and it was very, very challenging and very, very uh, great learning experience uh, for me and for the students, I think. Uh, I think we, we tried to sort of marry and combine the, the sort of the scientific approach with the most sort of cultural and uh, uh, aesthetic approach, right? How uh, trying to explain to the students how the ways we imagine uh, nature and we imagine the relations the relationship of we, human beings with our environment uh, has concrete very concrete uh, and very um, real effects uh, sometimes mm -hmm. and and I think it was it was good for the students who were by the way great and really engaged in the class uh, I think they could they could see that that was our, our main objective I think and uh, I, I, I try to do that 
I quite, I kind of want to give an example of some, I mean, we're going to get into another example, but I want to kind of give an example of something that, that I learned as part of the class, uh, being in, immersed in the class. So uh, for the longest time, right, I've been studying this deforestation, aspects of deforestation, and then one of the, one of the elements of that is the use of certain herbicides, right, and this widespread use of these herbicides that are actually used worldwide, they're pretty much in everything that we eat, you know, they're kind of like part of, of this world. So so Javier was coming in from a completely different this cultural perspective and opening up this entire literature from the southern cone of South America that revolves around the use of these agrochemicals, right? And so from the scientific perspective, we can, we can study the toxicology, we can kind of study how they contribute to certain processes, right? But I had no idea that there was this entire literature that is emerging in response to it to kind of change to kind of change culture or point to culture make this very evident to everyone that this is not cost free right that there is no free lunch that they use the, the industrialization of in the you know the, this industrial farming that relies on this particular technology has consequences for for people and that was something that really opened my eyes because i thought you know this is this is these novels that we're reading are probably going to have much more of an impact than if I write another paper with the toxicology, because these novels are, uh, are reaching the heart. They're going, they're going for the mind, but they're also going for the heart. Whereas if I just make another plot and, and, and tell that story in, only in the scientific environment, it's not going to have as much impact. So I was amazed by that, blown away. Yes, this class, I have to say, had the great, great responses from the from the students. We were very pleased with it and excited to be able to uh, offer on a, on a yearly basis. And um, another way you could um, make this topic uh, relatable to, to students in your way of teaching it is that uh, you to use the Amazon forest as a case study. Uh, it is said to be the center of the world. Uh, you present it like that. Could you please uh, explain why this assumption? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, so <clears throat> that, that was one of the, you know, the, when when we began uh, talking with Liliana and uh, when she was in my my Amazon course, uh, we we thought that when we was we were going to teach this class, the Amazon could be a good um, a, a good case study, right? Like where, where we could. Uh, exemplify and give specific uh, examples of what we were talking about in like more theory theoretical classes, right? And uh, the notion of the Amazon as center of the world is actually uh, belongs to Eliane Brum. She is a journalist, um, a Brazilian journalist, an activist, and writer. Uh, she has published many books. She has been a, a finalist for uh, well in the long list for uh, the international, uh, I think, uh, journalist prizes in the US. And uh, he, she uh, is very engaged with the peoples in Amazonia. She's working with uh, local peoples uh, and she's very, very committed with, uh, with, that, with that work, right? This, this kind of activist and local work. And, and what she's trying to uh, explain us is that what we need in order to uh, understand what is going on in Amazonia is actually to change the perspective in which we look at it, right? In which, in, in which, um, from which the perspective from which we look at our position in the world, right? And what we understand as the center and what we understand as periphery, right? The Amazon is is imagined as a, perif a peripheral place, right? A, a faraway place, but she uh, demands that we begin to think with the Amazon, try to understand the, the Amazon. And uh, as if, if, because it is the center of the world in the sense that uh, of its importance for the current uh, ecological crisis, right? So it's important right. that we, we change uh, the very, yeah, the, the very perspective uh, in which we, we see these, these spaces, right? Thank you. And what about you, Liliana? What's your take on the Amazon? Well, the thing about the Amazon is that from a scientific standpoint, from just from a purely physical standpoint, there is no scenario with current technology and technology is, of course, changing very quickly. But with the current technology, there's no scenario in which we limit global warming 
1.5 centigrade or two degrees centigrade, which is like uh, from four to five degrees Fahrenheit. There's no scenario in which we can manage to do that without conserving a vast forest, a vast tropical rainforest in the Amazon. There's just not. If we actually have no Amazon carbon sink, then our projections have to rise. And then the climate catastrophe just gets worse and worse. So that, that is a very important background. You know, that's the purely physical. And I believe that Eliana, Eliana Broom, whom uh, Javier just mentioned, she, you know, she, she's kind of, this is part of her story, but it's also this other cultural part, which is so, uh, so important. So at the same time, right now, even though we know, you know, like we, in a scientific sense, we understand and know that it's absolutely essential to maintain the carbon sink in the Amazon. We have ev evidence that this forest transformation, this degradation of the forest and conversion into giant pastures, right, is actually flipping the Amazon into a new state in which it's no longer a tropical rainforest, right? Because the Amazon actually literally creates its own climate. It creates its own evapotranspiration, which is just the water from the, the water cycle regulated by plants, right? It's, it relies on having the plants there. And if instead you just have these open fields, the dynamics of that water change, right? So there's this flipping effect where the Amazon, this, this web paper that came out this year, it could become a carbon source. It might be a carbon source already. The fires that are devastating the Amazon, the expansion of agriculture, in, of industrial type agriculture, not, not small scale agriculture, is making that ecosystem, which is a wet forest, very resilient, right? It's being replaced with a very arid environment, right? With a different vegetation and it's less resilient when it's turned into human made pastures and, and, and scrubs, right? So we have, we have this, you know, like the, the, the changes that are happening in the Amazon are at such a scale that they kind of flip an entire ecosystem. Now, here's the interesting thing is that that agriculture that is happening in the Amazon on this industrial scale, there is also evidence from recent uh, studies that that productivity is also declining. So what that means is that the gains of that transformation, the economic gains, right? Because there is, there is money involved that you can make by taking. The economics of that are actually very short lived, right? So that transformation is, is taking us into a very different trajectory for much more warming and we have right now, and it's changing. So it turns out that somebody like Eliana Broom is right on the money in terms of science. In terms of global climate, with the technology we have right now, yes, the Amazon is the center of the world. It is essential to the regulation of carbon around the world. Okay, well, thank you. But um, surely you're not the only one um, you know, saying these uh, th threatening things. And and yet, uh, talking about deforestation and and and, and the threat behind that. So where is the disconnect in your opinion? Well, the interesting thing, like if you get to a certain age and this is, I'm, I'm hope, I hope there's lots and lots of students in the audience, you realize that, that this is not the first rodeo, the first time we hear about conservation in the Amazon. We've been hearing about conservation in the Amazon for decades. You know, we heard about it in the eighties. We've, we've been hearing throughout the decades this talking about the rainforest, right? At least the last couple of decades intensifies, right? Now, I don't want to deny that there are actually very real gains for conservation in the Amazon. There is a vast network of indigenous territories that are protected and national parks that are protected and reserves that are protected. And the studies that I have done, some of them have actually, some of my colleagues that I work closely with have done these studies where they're figuring out what is the biological diversity of this area as compared to other matching areas. What is the carbon uh, status of these areas? And they consistently find that these protected areas are much better. They're much better in terms of being carbon sinks. They are much better in terms of biodiversity. So we know that they produce less emissions, that they maintain the biodiversity, that, they, this, that this level of protection is actually really good, right? So this is particularly well documented for indigenous territories, which are not depopulated. Indigenous, it's not like a national park where people aren't allowed to live there. They're quite the opposite. These are populated areas that are managed by indigenous people, but they are not managed with the interest of profit commercial exploitation. They are managed for indigenous people uses that may include uh, farming, but in their own space, in their own terms, in their own way. So the Amazon has this vast network and these are protected. But first of all, not all of the Amazon is protected, right? And 
as the Amazon as a carbon sink and as a vast repository of the biodiversity of the world, it cannot be just these little islands where the protected areas are islands and everything in between is a bunch of pastures or a bunch of commercial agriculture and ranching. It cannot be, right? And right now, the last few years, and particularly with the pandemic year, being an indigenous or an environmental activist or both in the Amazon is a very dangerous job. They are indigenous, indigenous and environmental leaders throughout the Amazon, and it's throughout every, in every single country under threat, right? There's violence on the ground, there's violence, right? And this is where I think we get back to that idea of this complementary approach, that if I'm just looking at these things on the map in the re remote sensing and the satellite imagery, and I do not know anything about the history and the economics of the region, they don't, I don't understand what's going on, right? I, don't, I, cannot, I cannot possibly contextualize what is happening. So we have to understand the Amazon, and this is, this is part of the work that I've done in the past, as a resource frontier. And by that, what I mean is that the forests, which are underused and which are populated, right? They are populated by indigenous peoples and they are used by indigenous peoples and they are used by local peoples, right? These forests are transformed into private properties, right? And how they articulate with finance. And in the process, this displaces the indigenous people. Right? And if that all sounds very familiar, it's because we, we are living in the North American continent where this process happened. It just happened in a different century. Right? What about you, Javier? I know that you study in particular the indigenous communities in, um, in Northeastern Brazil. Uh, yes, uh, actually what, what, what Eliana I was just saying uh, is, is very important, right? One of the exercises that also Eliane Broom helps us, uh, like teaches to do is sort of begin to listen to the voices from the Amazon, right? Uh, begin to listen to what people are saying, how people are perceiving these processes that Liliana is describing so clearly, right? How that has concrete and specific effects on people's lives, right? And, and how people uh, can talk about that, right? And uh, one of the things that uh, we, for example, explored in the class uh, are the writings, the writings of Davi Copenawa, who is a, uh, Yanomami shaman from Brazil, right? He has been going to international meetings, to international events, to the United Nations, to the, he has come to the US and come to Europe uh, to explain, uh, to, to, to tell the people how the, his people see the world, right? And how his people see uh, white people, right? The kind of, the, the understanding of the world that white people have, right? And he has, he's very interested because he's, he's, he understands that he needs, this is very interesting. Some uh, indigenous communities understand that they need to begin to speak and to travel and to be, be, be visible, become visible and sell a lot of books, right? Because they also need their voices to circulate and us to begin to talk about what they have to say in class and about their fundamentally different understanding of the world, right? What Liliana is saying, was saying, right? Professor Douglas was saying about the historical uh, discourses relating to the Amazon. Uh, she was insisting on the fact that the Amazon is inhabited, right? Mm -hmm. But if we remember like in the in the representation that like, historically, the way in, the, in which the Amazon was represented, it was represented as a desert, right? The, the word wilderness, right? Or desert mm -hmm. was used in Latin American texts by Latin American intellectuals by uh, US intellectuals and politicians uh, like such as like Teddy Roosevelt who traveled to the Amazon, right? And he thought of the Amazon as this last frontier, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and we know how the positions that Roosevelt had about the frontier, which, which positions had, he had about the frontiers, right? So this, this sort of <laughs> advancing of the frontier, this logic that has been present for centuries, right, regarding mm -hmm. Latin American culture from the, the colonial times, right, this idea that these regions that are still unknown, they have, they hide, right, many, many riches that we need to sort of get from them. It is still very, very present today and more than before probably in uh, the current Brazilian government has, has made that very clear, right, they, uh, they have like sort of re, uh, 
um, reconnected with a very important discourse, historical discourse, the, the, dictat the dictatorship in Brazil was the, the, the first moment in which this sort of infrastructural discourse about like building dams, building roads across of the Amazon began really to transform in an unprecedented way that region, right? So uh, when we hear what, what, what is happening today in the Amazon, we have to remember that these, some of these uh, topoi, right? These, these, uh, these, these images, right? These ways of imagining the territory have been with us for centuries and are still uh, causing very, very uh, concrete transformations. And uh, we have to be, be aware of that, I think. It's amazing because these words and ideas have consequences on the ground, right? When you were talking, Javier, I was thinking of President Fernando Belaunde Terry from, from Peru, who said, the Amazon is a land without people for a people without land. He mm -hmm. said that, and he was a strong promoter of this vision where you would have a single road that would cut on the Western Amazon, and that in my book, The Origins of Cocaine, we talk about the role of such a road, of such infrastructure, in, in, in creating these settlements and creating this kind of colonial um, settlements all around that part of the Amazon in the Western part, which is West of Brazil. Yeah. And so it's, this, is, this is like, it's been going on, it's been going on for centuries, but we can trace, we can trace current situations like the production of cocaine in the Andes at the edge of the Amazon. We can trace that to actual, uh, tr you know, these ideas creating transformations on the ground in the form of roads, right? Let's talk now about another bad habit that we need to uh, <laughs> let go of, fossil fuels. What are the alternatives? <laughs> another bad habit. One of the best, one of the most positive things that I, that I think about in, the, in, the recent, in recent years is that we actually have real alternatives now. We have real alternatives to fossil fuels. This was not the case you know, in the 1990s when the framework convention when climate change was being negotiated, there were not, not real alternatives. So we actually have a path towards facing, like we as, as societies, right? Like it, it requires investment and it requires action and it requires transformation, but there are technologies. And we, for the very first time, and this, is, this has been very fast over the last decade, we have the opportunity and the ability to decarbonize, right? Before it just simply, it wasn't realistic. And now we have this, you know, if you look at the curves, of the price of renewable energy, they, they keeps getting lower and lower and lower. I mean, just to give you an example, just like my own personal example, like most months I'm paying like minus fifty dollars to the utility com company because because of the capacity for renewables that is installed. But that capacity, you know, it costs money. It requires investment. It doesn't happen automatically. It's not going to happen. You know, it's not enough. The scale at which it's being adopted is not enough. The infrastructure for decarbonization is not yet enough. And in fact, decarbonizing is the moonshot of our times, right? It's the moonshot, like it, it, it should be on that level of, of national and international purpose, you know, to have a, a national level investment, right? Of course, when the moonshot was happening, you know, for people, for people who have read about it or who, who lived through it, right? They, it wasn't really replacing another industry. And that's part of the problem is that decarbonization is the process of replacing an industry that already exists, which is the fossil fuel industry, replacing it with other sources of energy, right? Decarbonizing completely. So we see that, you know, we see that tension, we see that emerge politically, we see that conflict happen. But I wanna say one thing, and it's not all bad news, and this is something that I like to share my, with my students though, is that I actually have personal, <laughs> I actually have family members that had been working in the fossil fuel industry. That's the level of engagement of like having a very personal level with that. And one of the best, you know, this happened like maybe five years ago when I thought, you know what? They see the writing on the wall because all of a sudden this family member who was kind of based out of some kind of offshore drilling and all of that actually move to a renewable plant. Mm. Their complete their complete business model. So even the fossil fuel industry instead in, in itself, they see the writing on the wall. They see that the future is not bright for maintaining their model, and they are retooling. And that's the best news I ever had. The question is. 
how do we get the political willing, how do we get the scaling that we need right now, right, to avert truly catastrophic outcomes. And Javier, from a more philosophical uh, perspective, how wh wh what is it that you could propose that would be more convincing or as convincing as the scientific, um, you know, data? Uh, well, no, I, I, I think it's 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 an urgent topic, it's, and we are talking, and we can see uh, one of the things we we discuss a lot in the, in the class is that we uh, when we um, sort of begin like this adventure of you know, teaching, co-teaching these, these, these issues is we uh, don't want to sort of send this kind of pessimistic message that uh, uh, so many times is so, so um, uh, terrible, right, to, to, to assume, right, and, and to try to do things, right, to discuss ways in which we can do things, right, uh, and well, later we will also talk about, uh, about uh, more, uh, uh, more current things uh, 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 that are happening today, um, but we we would, we have seen that uh, still there's there's a sort of uh, limit it seems in which governments are uh, able or willing to commit regarding fossil fuel fossil fuels today, right? So uh, I think this again to go back to this idea of of uh, <clears throat> the, the ways in which we uh we live right uh one of the one of the the texts that we we discuss in uh, sometimes in classes uh, is we discuss in, in, in the classes uh, is called the great the great derangement by by amitabh ghosh and one, one of the things he says is like uh that we have to be in a way realistic that uh, there is a, a very difficult it's a, it's a huge change for us today culturally to uh make these decisions but also when, when, we, uh, when we do uh, realize some of the things, right? When we read certain things about other ways of understanding uh, consumption, displacement, uh, um, production, right? Uh, so in, in this way uh, in which we begin to see how local communities, indigenous communities, uh, more, more, more conscious, more like communities who live closer to uh, with, with a more intimate relationship with with, with nature, with the environment, uh, things can be different, right? And and to sort of understand really what is uh, fundamental for our lives, what is essential for us, right? There are many many things that we think are essential, and it, it is it is a task, I think, of uh, education and changing again the the perspective to understand what is really uh, fundamental for us uh, today in order to sort of uh, yeah. Uh, change these bad habits that we, we may have, or like even even in a in a um, in a more more sort of a gradual way. But one of the things that, that Amitav Ghosh says in his book is very interesting that uh, uh, sometimes uh, people who don't really uh, care about uh, these issues or climate change, uh, they used to ask activists like. Oh, what do you do in your personal life to change, right? And, and I think, and he thinks, and I agree with that, that we have to begin also to understand that these, these big changes are, that the governments are the ones who need to begin changing really in a radical way, uh, an urgent way, the way they, uh, they, they teach us and they, they uh, uh, administer resources, right? Uh, sure. Thank. We'll talk much more about that later. But uh, I think uh, it's more like big changes are needed right now. So changes have to happen at the macro and the micro level, at the global and the local. Uh, so we're talking about activism now, and I want to know from all three of you. And I'll start with Peg because uh, she is probably the the activist. Uh, uh, she represents the activist side of, of, of the problem. Uh, how does activism translate into action in, in these specific cases that we've uh, talked about? Peg. Yeah, so I'm going to start with some local level things because I think um, Javier and Liana have you know, talked about you know, both the local levels and how indigenous people, for example, are affected by, um, by climate change or, or significant um, events. And you know, so I think it's scalable. Um, one of the things that I look at is, um, is for example, environmental rights to counter extractivism. 
mm -hmm. um, which is natural resource um, in Argentina and Bolivia and Paraguay. Um, you know, another just local example is projects that deal with um, developing solar batteries for Syrian refugee camps in Turkey. I mean, these are they're small, they seem like they're small examples, and yet they're very human examples because they affect uh, people who are very, you know, challenged by the effects of climate change. Um, a third example is in, um, in Guatemala, there's a, a project in which uh, women um, in indigenous communities are developing mealworm farms because because of the, the arid land, they have nothing else to grow on the farms. And so they use mealworms as a way to increase food and nutrient production, which, you know, again, to us maybe sounds, um, you, know, you know, crazy, but in a way you have to look at the context of what people are dealing with as a result of these, this really strong um, effect in the developing world on climate change. And then I guess a fourth, um, just example is um, reforestation of the mangroves in India. And this is a local, again, I look at women and gender, and this is a, a women-led project to, project to try to begin to reforest um, um, the mangroves. It's very significant. And, you know, one of the things that I often hear, well, why women? What, 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 you know, why focus on women? And, and so I think one of the things I just want to uh, mention about this is because women are, seem to be the ones that are most in, in closest contact with the land. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a tradition um, throughout the developing world that they notice changes more and that they are really more on the ground. I mean, one, one of the things that Javier mentioned about um, the great derangement, um, which I, I was fortunate um, to sit in on the first class that, that they, um, they offered in this and I learned a great deal. Um, and one of the examples that Ghosh gives is that there are something that the um, 1981 cyclone in Bangladesh um, killed 193,000 people. Um, of those 193,000, 90% were women. And so there's a fundamental focus here on what, how women um, identify with the land and what they can do um, in these local areas. So I'm going to stop with local levels. We'll get to national government levels in a minute. Yes, but, in a minute. That, uh, Peg, um, I really appreciate um, you giving these very practical examples on how you can um, do your activism on, on, on the ground. I didn't need, I didn't mean to single you out as, um, and, 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 and and, and assume that Javier and Liliana in their own uh, capacity are not activists. In fact, I want to ask uh, Javier, um, uh, in what way you practice your activism, your environmental activism through the humanities or through the, the classes that you teach? Uh, yeah, well, I, I, I think, uh, yeah, I actually, I, I don't know if I would call myself an activist, but I, I, I certainly, um, think that uh, there's much we can do to promote that I think uh, activism in class uh, and that uh, the I think it's important that we uh, communicate to students the importance of I think one of the things that I have realized like in these years uh, since I have begun really getting into uh, this this uh, uh, teaching and working uh, on, on environmental issues that is that a students really care about this. This is that is it's really important for them. It's one of the topics that they really is like, in, I think young people in general, but, uh, but students are, uh, are really interested in, in getting to know more uh, and getting to know ways of uh, getting to know what is going on, how they can help, what they can do. And I think we can, we can help as, as I, I said before, and also Liliana mentioned, I think the role of the humanities in this respect is also very important, right? I think through fiction and non-fiction words, many, I think many powerful words of literature have this kind of, can have this durable and concrete impact on activism and on scholarly work and public debates. Uh, and it, it, I think it is crucial that we begin to acknowledge the, the real power that words and the imagination can have over minds, over policies, over ideas about the world and the projects that, uh, that governments do and, and people also have uh, about, about nature, right? And uh, 
I think that is uh, very, very, very important. And one of the things that I think uh, is makes our our job uh, really uh, worth, worth worthwhile sometimes. Yes, thank you, Javier. And one thing is more human is to be seeing these things, but it's even, uh, it's even more uh, convincing when a scientist, um, um, you know, just uh, corroborates that. And I know that uh, uh, Liliana is, is, a, is a great uh, um, believer in, in the power of, of, um, of the humanities and the social and behavioral sciences um, onto the minds of, of people and helping, um, you know, impress that, that message that the scientists have been trying so hard to, to impress. Right, Liliana? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, one of one of the things, if we have learned anything about the process that we're going to talk a little bit more later, uh, the process of, of trying to get an international agreement and trying to get national governments to, to change the system in the direction of decarbonization or in the direction of averting climate catastrophe, is that um, a scientist making predictions and just talking from the standpoint of science over and over again in a congressional hearing or talking to that, that can put things on the map. But actually influencing the policies and shaping them and changing culture, that is not going to happen. That, and that and it hasn't been happening, you know, until the social and behavioral sciences, until the humanities get involved. And I want to single out the humanities because I want to single out some of the uh, things that I've been learning, um, again, partly by working with Javier and partly through my own reading, is that again, I, I feel like we're not gonna have, we are asking for a systems change, right? Whether it's at the national government level or whether we are doing it in a, in a more local scale, we are asking to change a system that was itself created and subsidized, and, right? Like we don't, we don't have roads the way that we do and we don't have gas stations the way that we do by accident or it just didn't happen, right? Like it wasn't just like a few, you know, it wasn't just like everybody decided to do that. It was like a process where there was a deliberate investment and there was a deliberate action, right? And now we are asking to replace that, to make deliberate actions that will replace that in the direction of decarbonization. And I feel like imagining our future to be different from the present is the job, is part of the job of the humanities, is part of literature. Like it's, it's giving us the possibility to dream of something that doesn't look like our past because we become so tethered, we become so trapped, right? And that's, that to me, like it's the limit of the, of the traditional, for example, cost and benefit type analysis. The limit is like, we are imagining a thing that is the same that we're familiar with. We are not imagining in order for us to really transform and go into a future that's decarbonized, we have to imagine something very different for ourselves, not just for other people, not just for uh, the, the kind of projects in, in many global locations that Peg was mentioning, but for ourselves. We have to imagine a future for ourselves in which we are whole and we thrive and we are decarbonized, right? And we need design, we need literature, we need culture to show us what that looks like as a positive thing, not just a negative thing of there will be floods and you will be uncomfortable and there will be mass migration and lots of people will die. That is not, you know, that, that which scientists, we've been saying that for years, that has not taken us where we need to be. We need to present decarbonization as a project for a future that is making us whole and that is making us thrive. So talking about that, what about COP26? What do you think um, of, um, of what they have um, in store for us? Uh, I, I wanted to ask this question to Peg in particular because Peg uh, was fortunate enough to be in Glasgow during the summit. And I want her to share her experience uh, there as an activist um, with, with, with our audience today. Uh, and for those uh, perhaps students who are not familiar with the acronym and the reason for this global summit, um, Peg, I'm going to ask you to, to, to give a little brief. Okay, well, I'm, I'll try to be um, brief um, and, and not too complicated because it is, as you can imagine, a UN conference is complicated. But uh, you know, as, as COP stands for the Conference of Parties. It was developed um, and started in 1995, as um, Liliana developed, um, mentioned, and it was basically the first frame to start 
looking at how the United Nations Framework Convention for Climate Change, the UNFCCC, so if you love acronyms, we've got them for you here at the UN, um, to try to um, address these issues. And I think that one of the things that evolved over time was the development of each country developing a, um, a statement of their promises. The promises were um, called the national, well, intended national develop, development um, contributions. And that is basically, what are we gonna do about climate change? And so you'll hear about the NDCs as nationally determined contributions when you do the reading for you know, understanding what happened in COP because each country is trying to exact language that they can that they feel that they can deliver on and it's really the um the the mission if you will of some of the constituency groups that are outside of cop that i'll talk about um, later on that really kind of push that to make the language more precise so how many you know what is the percentage is it going to be 2050 is it going to be 2070 what are some of the the limits to that so it's so that the dances that are that surround the, um, the, the, uh, the climate change conference really evolve around what the intentions are and what the actual actions are of the countries. And a lot of it does at this point in time need to address um, developing countries and what the developed countries will do for developing countries, which is um, something that the United States um, government is particularly focused on. So I'll leave it at that, it just kind of a, a general frame because I think there's much more that we can talk about um, that Liliana and Javier um, want to talk about um, in terms of what we can, you know, is COP a success or a failure and from what perspective. So I'll leave it to you guys to, to carry that through. Liliana, yes. Yeah, Just well, a failure. <laughs> I'm yeah. going to start with a little history because it, 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 I, I think I think Javier is used to me kind of going into this historical rambles, but there is a history of us as like when I say, you know, like scientists, right, sort of getting our hopes up, like I'm not going to go all the way back to the uh, 1990s, but in 2009, for example, the Copenhagen COP was supposed to deliver on a series of ambitious targets, right, so the idea was that, you know, 20 years ago, we were going to have this phasing out, this real investment and all of those things. Then in, in Paris 2015, there was this glimmer, you know, there was this big breakthrough because you have this, this agreement between the two uh, world's largest emitters of carbon dioxide, the United States and China, and the two come up with this agreement and, and you have the NDCs coming out with some ambitious targets, but really the two biggest emitters are kind of on the table and, and, and saying something, but, that commitment, when, when you look at the actual commitment that was, that was made, we understood, meaning the scientific community understood that that was like a foothold that wasn't going to deliver the reduction in the increase in temperature that the models told us and that is, is coming to pass now, right? So we understood 2015 to be just this kind of little foothold to get us to the more ambitious target that would actually rein it in, right? So now in this COP26, then the hopes are up. The idea is, yeah, we, uh, you know, the hopes are up in, or wear up in terms of like, there's going to be, you know, I'm, I'm going to talk to a, about a couple of points. One is on the aggregate, right, on how much, what is the carbon budget, right? And there's an artistry, meaning how much more carbon dioxide can be emitted, how much more of this housewarming glasses can be emitted in the entire world before, you know, to avert catastrophic change. And that's carbon budget. So having them something very strong in that. And then another thing that was a big dashed hope was that there was going to be this loss and damage mechanism. And what the loss and damage mechanism was a real, a very real transfer of funds, right? Where the countries that are the most responsible for this historical accumulation of climate changing gases were going to actually have loss and damage. And that fell to the wayside. However, points of hope. The language of loss and damage is still in COP26. So for the first time, right? Because there's there's like this huge fear that this is going to open liability, right? That the country, the, the island nations of the Pacific are going to band together and are going to sue in court and are going to say, United Kingdom, you've emitted such and such, such 
take you to court. Let's get some money out of this, right? There's a huge, there's a huge fear that this is what could come out of a loss and damage. And yet the language of loss and damage made it, right? The mechanism isn't there. There's no, there's no actual clear clearinghouse. There's no clearinghouse where this is gonna be handled. But the language for the first time since loss and damage, and then for the first time, right, we know about the carbon budget. We know there's very little leeway. There's not a lot of room for more carbon emissions into the atmosphere without having some major changes. We understand that. For the first time, the language of the COP actually talks about fossil fuels for the first time. And it talks about facing down coal, right? And that is, again, you can kind of, it's kind of like a glass half full, glass half empty type of situation. Because yes, some, you know, there was a hope that there was gonna be like a strong statement or about phasing out instead of phasing down. But this is the first time that we get some language of that nature in the COP. Mm -hmm. So I'm holding on to those moments of hope and, and, and also to just kind of say as a preview to, to other things that we'll talk about later that, the national and international stage is not the only place where think, where changes can happen. That's something that Peg also knows a lot about. Right, precisely. What activities do you think uh, people, young people, scholars, uh, scientists do in a community like ours to be pragmatic and, and constructive about it? Peg? Yeah, I'm looking at our time and I'm wondering if now is the time um, to really sort of provide the frame for that as far yes. as- um, Yes, exactly. I, I, I thought you could uh, uh, start yeah. showing your, your pictures uh, that captured the, the moment of, of, of Glasgow and, um, and precisely give some, uh, some hope and some ideas uh, to our listeners um, as to what, what, what went on there. And, uh, you know, the type of, uh, to just convey that energy that was there and that you, we can, um, yeah, I think I think it's really good to be able to break it down. I mean, because you know, the question that many people have is what can we do about it? You know, what can one little person, you know, or students, what can we do about it? We need to be educated for sure. But I think one of the things that I came away with from COP anyway, um, was that, you know, there is a scope here and there are many actors that are actually involved. Um, um, as mentioned in conversation with Ileana and Javier, the protests um, outside of the venue were actually very powerful. They communicated the key themes that many of, that we're just talking about right now. And they're keeping them, they're pushing at them. And I think that these key themes, especially the need for social justice, systemic changes, which is what Liliana was really getting to as well, you know, is something that is very um, important. Uh, for people to, uh, especially young people, um, but not only young people. Um, the fact the carbon markets that we talked about also very, very significant. Um, you know, many, many politicians and you know, can imagine the climate change conference had uh, many official statements, um, including Professor, uh, former President Obama. You know, he focused on the need for patience and compromise, but I think that these car that this protests outside of the venue really showed that people were thinking more about how to push a little bit um, because you have to push. Um, it's not going to happen um, within the framework of just uh, parties negotiating without some people outside of this. Um, just a, a very quick example. I thought social media was significant in the, in the conference. Um, the, the constituency group that I belong to, the women and gender constituency actually developed a color campaign in which every day they would distribute masks um, in a different color to represent a different theme. And believe me, these, these uh, you know, masks were so popular that we ended up running out of them. <laughs> but you know, they represented indigenous uh, feminists, uh, leadership, finance, regenerative economies, young feminists, no false solutions, um, you know, um, collective land rights and so forth. And so each day there was a reminder of another theme that was, that was really significant. Um, the photograph here, I don't know if you can recognize, but this person right here is um, um, AOC, who was very, very much um, a part of the negotiations and we had the largest, um, the United States had the largest congressional delegation 
um, that, it, that it has ever had um, at the climate change um, negotiations. Um, the other thing that is also part of what I would call civil society really at this point is um, this, the thing that I was most involved with, which was the, um, the Gender Just Climate Solutions Award, um, which you know, we, we, I was on a jury and we interviewed, we basically looked at 160 projects and of those we gave awards to three top projects um, um, uh, that I mentioned to you earlier. And these projects were, again, local level mm -hmm. initiatives and very important for the local level um, to understand that they are there and they are working and these things are very significant um, in the in COP. Uh, many, we the award ceremony was a packed house of people from all around um, the world and dignitaries as well. Some fun, as you can see, um, I'm having trouble with my, there we go. Oh. Um, but, you know, right after the ceremony, the award ceremony, so right after, you know, all of this great fun and talking about the way in which local um, projects can be, um, can be help, you know, can help um, empower women and, and communities, indigenous people as well. We had, um, you know, mentoring already beginning, already um, with the, with, with this, um, you know, uh, focus was just trying to make sure that people really develop these projects and scaled up the project. So the project in Guatemala, how it can be used in other regions or, or the um, extractivism uh, networking that was developed, how that can be expanded as well. So a lot was going on at this conference. Um, that really involved people that were maybe outside of the direct negotiations, but very much a part of, of people who, um, of, you know, pushing in the right directions. Um, I can certainly um, provide this PowerPoint for you all because I know it's going to be, um, you know, quick. I'm doing this very quickly just to kind of give you a sense of what that all, all happened. But one of the projects I mentioned was empowering refugee women, Syrian refugee women through um, solar engineering, and that can be expanded. Um, the second one was the meal flower that I mentioned in Guatemala. That was, and the third one was strengthening environmental defenders through the digital advocacy network. All of these things um, in the mangrove project, all of these things can really be scaled and people such as students in particular too um, can really become involved in these um, in these kinds of projects. Um, the women and gender constituency is one of nine, only nine stakeholder groups of the UNFCCC. So these nine stakeholder groups are sitting in the negotiations, you know, looking at the language, um, listening to the promises that, that leaders are making and trying to make the, the, the promises more concrete and more specific. So they have to be fairly well educated in terms of what, what, what is really involved. They need the Javier's and the Liliana's to help, under, you know, help people understand what, what the ramifications and what the, the visions and the imaginaries are for you know, what we want as a civil society. Um, for example, the women and gender constituency, these are the 11 um, demands, if you will, that we uh, came up with. Um, and we have issue briefs on each one of these that are very detailed. Um, this took a lot of you know, really very close work and understanding, but to understand what it means to have human rights in the Paris Agreement to keep the 1.5 alive, to deliver on finance and prioritize loss and damage. Um, you know, very, very significant aspects. So to have these nine constituency groups on the outside and not, you know, participating or observing and making um, statements, official statements is really, really, I think, um, moving the conversation forward. Um, one of the groups is the youth NGO, um, one very, very significant. I mean, I can see my students in this, in this, um, um, youth here because it really does um, um, represent so much of what young people are, how they be, can become involved and how they can gain an expertise in areas of, of interest. Um, for, here are the, 
the um, nine stakeholder groups. Mm -hmm. um, business and industry was the very first one. Bingo. <laughs> um, <laughs> environmental NGOs, local government, indigenous people, research and independent NGOs, trade uh, unions, women and gender, youth NGOs, and the newest one that is still in negotiation really is the farmers union. But you know what? What, what Liliana is is working with very specifically, I'm sure, in ways you know that are important is are the research and independent because that's the the scientific research framework as well as the environmental, and the work that Javier is doing in particular, um, is going to be looking at indigenous peoples organizations and imagining you know as well number two the environmental. Um, aspects. So these are just um, kind of brief examples, but just to give you a sense of what what really is involved in imagining a different world, if you will. I mean, here are, you know, these are the negotiations. This is where the parties are making their statements. And here are the, um, the, the people that are involved in listening and processing and providing um, suggestions. They call them interventions but the suggestions on how to um, change the language and, and, and so forth. Um, you know, and women and gender have given um, official um, statements in this regard as the others. There's also panels, uh, there were also panels on collective land rights, for example, and advancing such sexual and reproductive health rights for climate change adaptation. So there's a lot of different um, sort of subjects, almost any subject you can imagine can be related and focused um, on um, climate change. Climate finance is, of course, a very big issue. Um, it was a very big issue in the, in the engagement. In addition to the negotiation uh, framework, there's also in the, what they call the blue zone was the official zone for um, party members and observer groups in particular. Um, was the, um, the pavilions and each country and, each, and NGOs also had their own sort of place to make a case for what they were doing and what they wanted to do. And so, for example, um, the UN, United States had its center. Um, this is um, a talk that was given by Samantha Powers. May, 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 some of you may have read her work. She was an, um, very important in the Obama administration and is just newly appointed as the director of the US Agency for International um, Development. And she basically discussed what the U US commitments are and how she can see ways forward in, in the area, particularly of loss and damage. So this, you know, this idea that, um, that Liliana was describing about, let's not lose, we're not losing hope, the language is there. And mm -hmm. next year, we will be you know, working on more language. Um, so that's important. Um, the final part here um, of the conference that I wanted to share with you is aside from the blue zone where the pavilions and negotiations and so forth took place was something called in a separate building called the green zone. And these are the public spaces in which people, students, um, journalists, high level public officials could visit I mean, I was, I was, um, you know, we all had our, you know, time of sitting at the booths and talking to people about what we were doing. Um, and even, you know, um, I was in interviewed by a BBC port correspondent about the work that the women and gender constituency was doing. And we even had um, Prince um, William um, visited and talked with us about the work that he's doing is a very a strong proponent of women's um, entrepreneurship, which is very significant um, in, in the talks. There were other dignitaries that were part of this, that again, they wore our masks, which is really <laughs> significant. <laughs> it's a simple thing, right? A simple thing, a mask. And yet, you know, feminist climate justice seemed to be pervasive throughout. Um, on, the, uh, on this side where um, the be beautiful, um, woman who's wearing the um, red and, and beige um, 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 clothing, she is the director or the head of the Indigenous Peoples NGO, um, next to Kavita Naidu, who is one of our um, the women and gender constituencies 
um, um, human rights attorneys who were, has worked very, very careful. And it's the, the amount of detail that she carries around understanding what the, you know, what, ne what needs to happen in negotiations is very significant. Um, and then on the other, and the other photo is of, again of AOC and the uh, president of the UN Women's Association or organization. So there's a lot um, of energy that needs that can that needs to be sustained in this kind of framework here. Um, just seeing the way in which people would write their demands or that what do they want? What do they want out of their future? Um, so many students, um, so many young people were involved in, in looking at, um, in, in um, commenting on what they want in their future. In fact, when I got back from Glasgow, there was a, a woman who contacted me um, who wanted to tell me about two other women that she knew that were very significant um, to providing that strength and that push um, for um, um, you know, climate change activities. One was a uh, woman, Samira Kitman from Afghanistan, who used art as a way to, um, she started an art institute to train um, Afghan women in art. And then she, cre you know, she made, um, uh, she got a large contract through a Saudi Arabian five-star hotel <laughs> and shared the profit with, with those to provide jobs in Kabul. And it's the, it's the activism and the interest in, again, the climate related projects that really push her forward. Unfortunately, she's not allowed to live in Afghanistan now. She moved to the UK because of um, threats. Um, but the fact that she's committed is very important. Um, and finally, I'll leave you with just another example. Um, and this is uh, Rosa Salih, who is from um, Iraq and who moved again to the UK for asylum when she was young. Um, she has since organized um, students to protest um, the way in which um, 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 families and children were deported um, from, from Scotland. And uh, she has you know, become so popular, almost iconic figure that she, that there's a musical, the Glasgow Girls that have been, that's been produced. And um, she's also you know, very involved in government um, service through the Scottish parliament. So I just leave you with these as examples of the ways in which the, I guess the energy and the way in which people really did uh, become part of what could be you know, a very, you know, obviously, um, you know, the, the COP26 has lots of very important issues that needs to be dealt with. And they need these people, these young people um, to, to carry them forward and to push the envelope, if you will. So I will leave it at that. I think I went a little bit over, <laughs> sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Peg, for sharing your um, your experience at uh, COP26. And we wanted deliberately to end with on, the, on an optimistic note, uh, despite you know how depressing the the, the the situation is, and despite uh, you know the controversies over you know the outcomes of of, of the summit, uh, we want to um, the reason why at GLI we we teach what we teach is precisely because we feel like there is hope to. To, 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 to do good things in, and there's hope for our students to make a difference. And, um, and so uh, we're opening the floor now to, to the question because we have a huge audience. We're very pleased with that. And so um, I'll uh, give the floor to Michelle from Global Affairs because she will handle the, 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 the questions. All right, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. My computer just froze for a little bit. So we do have a question. Um, what are your perspectives on Greta Thunberg's actions and efforts to raise awareness on the impacts of climate change and global warming? Hey, I mean, I, I mean, I could just, she was obviously, Greta Thunberg was there and a lot of energy. And I think it's, um, she is one of many. Mm -hmm. um, people who are very involved and I think but what I think she does is help us bring that conversation um, forward so I will leave it at that and maybe Javier and Liliana will have other 
um, also perspectives on, on, on Thunberg's um, involvement in activism, if you will. I think a, a form of activism, what I find really interesting about it is because she started really young. And so she's not kind of necessarily talking the language of, or not at all talking the language of diplomacy. She's sort of, uh, you know, coming out with a very clear and, and, and unscripted message and saying, are you really taking this seriously or is this just lip service? So she's kind of says the things that diplomats at a negotiation table cannot really, you know, like if you're at a negotiation table and you're talking international diplomacy, there's, there's like a mechanics to that that is very different from her path to activism. And I find that really interesting because some of these things just, you know, they needed to be said, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I, I wouldn't, I, I would, you know, I, I, I think it's, uh, it's a voice that is necessary. And it's also a voice which has some, some particularities as, uh, as Professor Davalos was, was, was mentioning, right? Uh, this idea of like this kind of non-conforming and demanding and uh, being sort of uh, <clears throat> tending to, to see the, uh, the glass, uh, the, 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 the things that are missing in the in the glass right <laughs> uh but um but i think i think that's a perspective that is is useful because it is it is not a it's a very passionate voice it's a voice that uh and, and yeah and to peg what, what peg was saying i think it's a very also uh it's, it's one of it's you know it's, it's a good example also and and a good um and she's doing what many other people are doing too so uh it, it's, yeah it's, it's very encouraging All right, does anyone else have any other questions? We have a few that are more like mechanics. Don't be shy, you can type your questions into the Q&A. I mean, we've given you so much, you it's know. It's a lot of information. A lot to, take in, but um, I'm sure that, you know, Javier, Liliana, Sophie, and I would be will more than happy to, you know, talk further um, if you think of questions too. Yes, we'll be happy to follow up with any questions. Uh, you know where to find us. Mm -hmm. And the Institute for Globalization Studies, you can go through that. Um, we, we are very grateful for Global Affairs for, for organizing this event it's, um, and, and, and drawing so many people um, on, on obviously a, a topic that is uh, a key topic. Uh, so I invite everybody to, to stay in touch with us, um, especially because um, our theme for the lecture series uh, in the spring is, um, is, is climate change. And um, you know its its impact on other aspects of, um, of of globalization. So we will uh, send announcement. Okay, and we have two questions. Yes, um, I love all the panelists' passion. Thank you for what you do. Was one of the questions, not a question, but a big thank you to all That's of nice you. Comment. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Um, and then how big of a say do indigenous people have on the matter of climate change initiatives? Um, I just wanna answer one thing, cause maybe Javier and Liliana, but one of the things that I was amazed to find is that, you know, of the nine constituency groups that I um, mentioned to you, that I showed you, the indigenous people's NGO was the strongest and best organized. It was amazing and it has been for a long time. So. Um, you know, there's a lot of interaction among the various NGOs, but um, the NGO, the Indigenous Peoples NGO, is very strong. Yeah. Um, but but I want to I but I only see it from that perspective. So I'd love to know what Javier and Liliana are finding. Well, well, I think I think it's interesting because these processes, uh, these processes when they started out, they didn't include as many of these Indigenous voices. Like again in the 1990s, and this is shift. This has shifted like recently, very quickly. So to give you an example, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature 
which is the organization that does the red list, right, of threatened species around the world. It met this year in Marseille, and once, and just like Peg described, the indigenous peoples NGO organization was the best organized contingent and actually have managed to, in that sphere, as well as in COP26, sort of introduce language that recognizes indigenous peoples. And we see it in COP26 and we see it in the IUCN, a clear statement with the, with the IUCN uh, declaration that came out, they actually, uh, you know, that's, this is breathtaking what, they, what the indigenous peoples did at the IUCN. They repealed, so you may remember that after Columbus set foot somewhere in the Antilles, in Spain, documents got sent to the Pope to make a decision later that split the Americas into a Spanish part and a, and a, and a Portuguese part, right? And that document states the doctrine of conquest. Well, at the IOCN, the indigenous organizations were so organized that they repealed the doctrine of conquest. <laughs> they repealed a 500 year old doctrine of conquest of territories mm. that technically it's not superseded. It's actually a legal basis for all of the colonization of the Americas, wow. right? And that's how organized. And then at COP26, if you look at the language of COP26, there's a recognition of indigenous territories as being critical to climate. There's an actual statement. So it pays to be organized. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, I wouldn't agree. I wouldn't add. Uh, I wouldn't add anything else. I mean, it's very clear. Uh, as I was saying, there is sort of a very kind of clear, conscious, uh, self-conscious in, in indigenous communities that is important for them to be to begin to uh, be heard, right, and communicate and uh, travel and be present and, uh, and make their voice heard. And uh, they have understood that this is, this is the way to to be to raise awareness, to protect themselves from other for, from the, the, the current dangers that, that they are experiencing too, right? Uh, people know about if people know about them, uh, people will be able to also, uh, yeah, that, uh, maybe protect them and, and and try to try to work with them. Uh, and this is this is one of the things that uh, I think is very important, and we are seeing in like there's more and more books written by indigenous uh, indigenous uh, shamans, indigenous indigenous uh, uh, thinkers, artists that are very very more and more visible. Yeah, that's interesting. All right, so I think we have time for one final question. Um, it's a long one, so get prepped. Um, while renewable energies do not contribute to carbon emissions, they still often have adverse environmental effects. Um, chemicals used to mine lithium for batteries, impacts of large dams on local ecosystems, the possibility of nuclear waste products not being handled properly, et cetera. I would like to ask you to suggest, or I would like to ask how you suggest to go about dealing with these issues. Because while fossil fuels are very harmful to the environment, a lot of renewables can be harmful as well. Great question. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think one of the, you know, we know that the carbonization includes trade-offs, right? But I think one of the things that I take away from, from being in this panel and seeing like the energy that Peg, that, that Peg was recording out in Glasgow, right, is that self-determination and environmental justice are critical components of this. Why am I bringing this up? Because one of the issues uh, with things like dams, like infrastructure construction or nuclear waste, is that they end up in the places where marginalized peoples are. They end up, you know, they do not, we live in a very unequal world and the, the, the pandemic has only heightened that sense, right? It, it's revealed the cracks all around the world of this inequality and the fact, the fact that this inequality is a part and parcel. So the fact that activists on the ground in Glasgow are saying, yes, we want decarbonization, but we also want the self-determination. So that this, when these decisions are made about what, where, what do we do with the waste? What do we do with these things? They are made with the participation and not just to dump, right? 
to dump this waste or to or, or to take over the lands of local peoples and to take to include that right and and i think that that self-determination is absolutely necessary because you know we didn't we didn't get into this climate you know the the problems that we face in right now in in trying to decarbonize they come from a system and it's a system in which in order to get the power and get the energy you can take over you can take you know i was just talking about that doctrine of, of discovery that was the IUCN voted on, right? You, some kinds of people and some organizations and some entities have the right that supersedes the local determinations, right? And I think the the uh, the type of activism that we're seeing in a place like Glasgow is for saying, no, we need to be able to have a democratic process for deciding this that protects the rights of this of these groups and that protects the rights of minorities worldwide, so that we don't say, oh. We're going to replace fossil fuels and now all the nuclear waste is going to go to your community right so yes environmental rights are human rights is my point i guess yeah very good there's one more question that looks kind of interesting too maybe yes the g20 summit takes place every year yet there are no concrete global sustainability plans taken by the leading nations in the world the un is also not that dictating as a global body. Should there be a global authoritative body who take important decisions regarding climate change and environmental issues, which all nations have to follow no matter what? Well, <laughs> we, don't, we, don't even, we, we don't even have that for war. <laughs> yeah. I would just have one comment and Liliana I'm, and Javier, I'm sure you will talk more about this, but you know, the United States kind of policy is now trying to place climate change as a national security threat. Mm -hmm. And it's the only way so far that we've been able to see how we can really bring this conversation front and center so that there is more, you know, more, if you will, um, you know, power behind the, the, um, the promises, if you will. Yeah, I think uh, you have to come to our class to uh, <laughs> Absolutely. With us. That's a great way. That's a great way to wrap up. Yeah. Great class. Right, well, great class. Well, I would like to thank all of our panelists, um, Dr. Spitzer, Dr. Uriarty, and Dr. Davalos for your time. And a special thank you to Dr. Reynold Leroy for pulling this all together and um, making this happen. So thank you to you all. Thank you to our participants for attending and coming up with some great questions. I'm sure our panelists would be happy to answer any additional questions you may have if you contact them directly. Um, and I wish everyone again a wonderful International Education Week and a wonderful evening. Thank you all for attending.